Welcome. It's another session of the Nonprofit Chat Live. You may be listening to this live or watching us on the video. It's, or you may be listening to the Nonprofit Exchange podcast. So we will use descriptive words because you can't see us. And there's no slides. There's no handouts. We're just going to talk about some really important stuff tonight. Russell Dennis has been my co-host in this series. Russell, how are you doing tonight? It's another fine night here in the, in the Mountain West. Beautiful skies and life is good. You are always good, man. Um, we're, in those, we're in the old mountains. You got the young mountains. I'm in Southwest Virginia where we have those green mountains. And it's a lovely evening, lovely evening. We have a, a mutual friend on here tonight. And besides that, we know that he's a very skilled professional. And he, he works with business leaders at all levels. He's got a special niche of helping entrepreneurs get clarity with their vision, clarity of where their market is, and clarity of how they're going to get there. We call that strategy. Um, and he's done some amazing projects with some specific nonprofits, a lot of them, but there have been some that have really done well. And Ed, Ed understands the nonprofit space. He understands what the challenges are, and he understands how to, how to come around and, and, and address those challenges. Ed, welcome to the Nonprofit Chat tonight. Thanks, Hugh. I'm privileged to be here. Got a great passion for the nonprofit world. We need them to all do their jobs and live to their mission and vision so that we can make it a better world. So whatever I can do to help. That's great. Um, somebody once taught me that uh, the work of nonprofits is more important now than ever before in history, and there's fewer resources. So we really have to do really well at describing the impact that we're going to have on people's lives. I think that was a guy named Ed Bogle that told me that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I pounded on you about some of that stuff, didn't I, Hugh? Well, you know, so, so many nonprofits and even our churches come from a position of scared scarcity so often and and you know that clarity of vision and that clarity of you know the persona the branding I guess you talked a couple of sessions ago about the branding world it's what gets people excited and connected to your brand you kind of got to take a little bit of a business flavor to it and when we do that we find some pretty magnanimous results so uh, you know we really like to carry into the nonprofits a lot of the business sector stuff in fact hopefully do it better David Dunworth on here. He was on a, a, a few sessions ago. Yeah, and, I know David. And then um, our friend David uh, Corbin talked about that brand slaughter. And <laughs> yes, he does. We, we illuminated a few things in that session, as you as you might might expect. All right. Let's start out, and and everybody has uh, a uniqueness to to share about this. And as I understand strategy, it's the framework that's going to help us engage our stakeholders. Otherwise, people are kind of hunting and picking for what to do. And it's the clarity of the, the sequence. It's the uh, railroad tracks to get you from where you are to where you want to be. Before we go into the, the strategy world, let's, let's, uh, let's talk about the Bogle world. And it's not the wine Bogle world. It's the Ed Bogle world. Ed Gum. I drink a lot of that. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure people bring it over and you have a whole, whole closet full. At one time, we had 45 bottles of Bogle wine in our house. So. Okay. I know what to ask for next time I'm there. Um, let's talk about Ed Bogle. Who is Ed Bogle, and what's, what's your background with strategy, and why is that important to you? To you first, and then we'll talk about it for others. Okay. Well, basically, I would, I would undergraduate was in marketing, graduate degree was in strategy, but I was trained as an investment banker, commercial lender until that bank brought in a new president. And they said, you know, we want you to become the marketing and strategy guy. Cause you've got the educational background for it. You've just finished our year long management development program and you can do that. So I took that on and the long and the short of that story is we grew that bank from 250 million to 1.6 billion in less than four years without an acquisition. It was all organic growth because we, he gave me carte blanche to focus on what was changing in the marketplace and how we related to our customers and what was going on. And so that, that early on lessons was all about getting not only outside the box, don't see the box. It was innovate. We did some innovative stuff. Some of you may have heard of about a little piece of equipment called an ATM. 
we put the first remote automated teller system in the country out. We put 12 units out all at once. Mm. We promoted the living daylights out of it. That was 1975. So the importance of that lessons is, is to look for the innovation, to look for the change. And we so far exceeded our own expectations of what that would do. And then I went to work for the, after I left the banking industry, I went to work for a little firm called Arthur Young, now Ernst & Young, then one of the big eight consulting firms. And I was part of a team at 12, or I mean seven, that built their strategy process. And over a course of about a year long, years in length, and then I was led a team of three that adopted that to the entrepreneurial services world. And it was in my days at Arthur Young that I had my first brushes with the nonprofit world. Okay. Yeah. And I, you know, I saw a lot of people running around with a lot of tasks and a lot of people holding out their hats, begging for the same donors every year. That's where I learned the term called donor fatigue. Mm -hmm. which all of us are feel, familiar with. We wear them out, that kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. while I was at Arthur Young, we created a whole process called the Focus Strategic Framework. Our plans end up on one page, and we've used it in the nonprofit sector as well as the church sector. Uh, you know, and, and, and it's all about change because one of the great lessons of strategy that I learned through all of that course of, of effort was that the only constant in the future is change, Okay. And if the world's, if you agree that the world's going to change and you agree that it's pretty unpredictable, which I think most people would go with. In fact, when I speak and I lecture, I ask people, how many of you believe that the conditions under which your business exists today will be the same three years from now? I'd never have anybody raise their hands. And I would suspect that would be true in the nonprofit world. The way you conduct your business won't be the same three years from now. So we get that clarity of vision, that clarity of purpose that engagement culture that really goes with this. People ride for the brand, and that's such a critical part of the integration of the framework process. Yeah, we've got to do vision, mission, brand strategy. We have set objectives and all of that, but we know that's all going to change. So we like to get people out into a horizon of five to seven years out, but then concentrate on what we're going to do the next 12 to 18 months, and then build such a culture internally the people are engaged in change, but they've got their antennae up. And it's not solely the responsibility of the leadership of any organization. It's a responsibility of everybody. And I don't know if the brand guys talk to this, but I, if I can get everybody in my organization writing for the brand, in other words, they defend the brand, they understand the brand, they have clarity of mission, vision, you know, the purpose of the organization and it, their role in fulfilling that, their role. I'm not talking about their job description. I'm talking about their role. If I get that, then I will have the ability to change and integrate and build a culture that will be successful. And then if I study the marketplace, the other piece of it, and I'm, <laughs> Hugh knows this very, very well. I'm a dyed in the world market side guy. It starts and stops with a customer or a, you know, somebody that, you know, you're engaging in your organization. It starts with your constituency, your stakeholders. And what is it and how is it we're creating value for them? And then how do we migrate that value over time? If I may pick on the churches for just a second, why is it that all the big churches out there now seem to be these <laughs> kind of rock and roll churches, as I call them? The non-traditional churches are having trouble getting people in their pews. Yet these churches, like there's one here that has, they have 26 locations around the country, but it's called Life Church. They have four locations in Tulsa. That place is packed. They have six services on Sunday, and it's packed, all six services. So where is that coming from? It's all about understanding your target market and how you serve them. I'll quit there because I'm getting, I still feel like I'm starting to teach class. <laughs> That's part of what it is. Russ, is that... Does that tweak some some interest for you? Oh, that all makes perfect sense. I mean, this is some of the things that I've been trying to, to convey to people uh, in creating a framework. When I work with uh, nonprofits, it's it's getting to that mission and understanding who you are at the core. And knowing people at the at the very core is really important because when you look at those churches, those churches with the with the music. One thing you'll find is that they've got a younger audience. And uh, Very much so. so, you know, you're going out there, it's really 
talking to markets. And it, it almost seems like dirty language to, to some people in the nonprofit world. But really, what we have are customers, and we just got different segments, like your donors uh, are one segment, and the people who get your services are the other. So if you don't understand what they need, the people that you uh, put programs together to serve, nobody will access your services. Right. And I've had talks with people that said, I don't get it. Nobody's coming. And uh, so we went through and talked about what some of the needs of those clients were. And there's definitely a need, but they decided they were going to operate out of a location that was not accessible to the people they wanted to serve. Yeah. Yeah, just we found that the the church world um, is not very different than some of the other worlds. I was um, on a, a chamber uh, webinar today with one of the chambers in Florida, and um, engagement, and especially engagement with the millennials. And you, you and I have talked about this some. Mm -hmm. um, they said the other organizations in the neighborhood, the Rotaries, mm -hmm. and some of the other service clubs have have had sidebar with the chamber saying we're having trouble growing our membership we're having trouble um engaging people and and i uh, was 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 a whole session about board empowerment today and i suggested that that there were with a lack of strategy people don't know where to be engaged or what to do and they aren't they aren't really clear what the end game is and Furthermore, if they weren't part of the initial planning process or at least a revision and upgrading and uh, doing tactics from the long-term objectives that you, you've taught me, they really aren't engaged at all. And so there's, there's, a, there's a trend for boards to not be effective. Now, we're, as we're talking here, Renee Shaw is out there in Salt Lake City, I notice, and she's got her board in the room with her. They tried to watch one of my videos and it, <clears throat> it was only five seconds. It was a very short message, so I've <laughs> I've got to go figure out what 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 happened to that one. But uh, I I pinged them and says, "Come watch Ed for strategy." So let's go back to the the centrality of strategy. As as you know, I approach the world with the right and left brain as a musician. We have a very specific framework, which is in music. It's the it's the the sheet music itself, the music musical score, and then all the players have their parts. So the analogy I make is that's your strategy and everybody in the team has their own piece of the action plan. Mm -hmm. And so they know when to play, how loud to play, how fast to play. And we end up directing the process rather than trying to do it all. And so there's a, there's a heavy lifting on the front to put that together. So come at, come respond to some of that long dialogue about strategy. I'm a, I'm an Ed Bogle strategy fan because I think you strategize your life as well as everything else. Yeah, but my wife also told me that that didn't work very well in strategizing your life and your raising of your children. And with the latter, I would totally agree. It's impossible to strategize raising children. So give it up if you're trying it. I tried it. It doesn't work. But anyway, in response to what you were talking about, Hugh, the, the whole thing is, you know, you want everybody in your organization to be bought into the mission and vision of what you're doing. Therefore, they need to be a part. That doesn't mean they need to sit through long planning meetings, but they need to be a part of the development of that strategy. And, and, and in particular, one of the things we do oftentimes is we have people that in the organization that have different roles or employees, in the case of some of them, that they write their description of what their role, not their job description, not their daily task, but what's their role in completing or living to that vision and mission of that organization. And it's stunning what we come up with. So if we attach them to this one page framework or any framework tool you use, what happens is, is guess what? They now have ownership. You know, uh, Russell mentioned uh, the word common sense earlier. And I guess the old adage is if it was, it's not so common, <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> you know, so uncommon. What, what we, what in particular that gives organizations sustainability stickability is the engagement like cultures okay because I want people internally writing for the brand and to me that means that they're bought into that constant collaboration and innovation they don't have silos of jobs but they're wrapped around what it is that our value our brand promise is to our constituents 
what's our brand position? Why is, is, you know, and how do they attach to that? And what's their role in doing that? And we use a few tools to do that. And I know, Hugh, you've got a number of things you do in working with organizations to bring them to that level. Gosh, if, they, if they've got this framework down and they understand it, if, if you can envision, we have a one-page framework, okay? And it links from vision, mission, vision, values, purposes, grand strategy, all the way out to long-term objectives, competencies, capabilities, long-term objectives, short-term objectives, strategies, and action plan. So it's a big one page. But at the end of the day, I had a client, a couple of clients that have done it now, they blow up wall-sized versions of this framework. And we would do training sessions where they would work with their department, their division, their people, or themselves individually as to how am I attached to that framework, to that strategy. And then they all autograph that framework. And there's one client that I started working with nearly 30 years ago that still does that stuff. And, uh, you know, that they're running out of places for people to sign. But it's amazing the difference it makes when you bring that level of consciousness up of their connection to the organization and its vision mission, as opposed to a set of tasks, a job task. So it's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's critically important. I don't care if you're a charity, a church, or a for-profit. You, you have to have the people, today's world, if the only constant is to change, how do you change? You've got to have the people going with you. And in fact, if you really look deeply at innovation in organizations, it usually comes from the lowest level and those people closest to our constituents and customers. Am I making any sense or am you I? Are. You are. And, and addressing the needs of the world. And you, um, you stress when you teach, I've seen you teach a lot. And usually when I'm with you, you're teaching me. You don't know it, but I'm listening. Um, the describing the impact, especially for charities. If, mm -hmm. if we're going to... Um, attract people who want to be engaged with us. And as you know, in Center Vision, we're encouraging people to use other words than volunteer. We want servant leader. We want a community leader. And in churches, it's members in ministry. So there's another term which indicates that they're actually active and they're actually doing something meaningful. Volunteer is sort of a laid back, I'm going to do what I have to and then go home kind of thing. So we're about changing, changing paradigms. And we, we, we get stuck in the activity mode rather than the results mode. And part of what, what I value about your teaching is we, we define the end result. We look at what we're going towards. So then we get people looking the same direction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I, I heard you say a couple of things here. Uh, and I want to come back and ask you the significance. But the one of them is about the one page. The other one was, I've met your children. I think you did a fine job. They're fine human beings. So. So they, My wife did. Yeah, that's right. It's usually the case. <laughs> credit where credit's due, please. Yeah, it's overcame our, our shortages. So yes. the one page, what's the significance of being able to have it on one page? It, there are a couple of things or points about that. One, it's easy to digest and look at it. Granted, there's a lot of supporting documents sometimes. And in fact, when we set these up in electronic files, you can go to mission and there'll be linkages of documents, and videos and other things for people that want to understand and learn about, you know, those parts of it. But it's, it's a, it, we call it an agenda for leadership because it links everything together. So the leaders of the organization now have an ability to go in and say, hey, here's our framework. And when we do our we, most of my clients do quarterly reviews, including the nonprofits. They go in and they do what we call the rear view mirror and the windshield. You may have heard those terms. Rear view mirror, what's happened to us and why. And I'm going to hold up my, for you radio listeners, I'm holding up my fingers about the size of a rear view mirror. Okay. And then you've got the windshield and I'm holding my hands way apart. That's about the proportionate time you spend on that. Because the rear view mirror, what happened to you, it's, can't do anything about it, but you can take a little bit of the lessons learned. In fact, some organizations now are not even doing any uh, rearview mirror. The Twitter CEO said a couple of years ago, we don't even look in the rearview mirror anymore. It's all forward. So it's a little bit of creating processes internal. And what you do is you do your rearview mirror and you look at you at your windshield, you bring it back then to that framework and see do we need to change strategies? Is it something that we need to do now? Do we need to reallocate resources? That one-page framework becomes the document from which 
you can make decision and assess changes in your organizations, and make things happen. I just brought David Dunworth in and Renee, I accidentally hey, put, put you in the picture. So watch what you do. Uh oh, David, I lost you. Well, he said hello and he went away. Yeah, I guess I, I usually takes me a little longer than oh, that. There he is. <laughs> Renee, um, if you're listening, I actually put you on the screen. So watch what you watch what you're doing there. <laughs> she's with her team. I think she's probably in the background. Renee Shaw. I lost um, David. I lost David. He'll come back. Um, so yeah, hello, he, 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 he keeps coming back. So. Hello, Renee. We put you on the screen, so so you're you're live. Hi there. <laughs> She's out there in Salt Lake. It was an accident. So I was going to have David do some 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 uh, comments because he did such a stunning job on this topic and and there's some synergy in what you're saying and what um, um, of course David Corbin said and, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. and everybody brings a little bit of extra perspective to the topics that people think they know a lot about but we really don't. Um, uh, so I like that. Russell, you got, you got a comment or a question brewing. He needs a hard question. <laughs> well, you can't hey. stop a man that's as brilliant as he had. He's, he's in there. He's <laughs> been to a few hey, rodeos and seen a lot of something. Things. I don't know what so, it is. <laughs> a lot of what, he, what he's talking about are things that I try to incorporate. And mm -hmm. having that buy-in is really important by having everybody participate in it. Right. Uh, that seems to be a little bit of a of a problem spot from yeah. what I'm seeing. You you get uh, you get a few people. You might even have like a power driver or some really uh, strong personality in the group, and they just kind of take over. Yeah. And people don't uh, don't have that buy-in if you don't bring everybody together and formulate. I, I see that again and again. Yeah, and that doesn't mean you have to drag people through lots and lots of meetings. All Lord knows, especially in the corporate world, we have enough meetings. In fact, in one of my larger clients, they refer to it as staff meetings or staff infections is what they affectionately call it. We have other staff infection going on. And, and so we can get in too many meetings. So there's, there's all sorts of tools and techniques we use to get that level of participation. But it's not a top down, it's a top down, bottoms up, tops down, bottoms up, continuous flow of thought and conversation about strategy. Strategy is not the annual, I don't know if I can say this, but it's not the annual perfunctory enema that we go through to come up with a budget, which is what most corporations do. Mm -hmm. It is a process that should be in, integrated in and be a part of your management systems. It's not a, an outlier that occurs once a year to create a plan and a budget because most of that ends, and Hugh loves this phrase, most of those plans end up as credenza wear. They, they go through this process, and any of you that worked in corporate America know exactly what I'm talking about. They go through this annual ballyhoo about, oh, here's our assumptions and here's our plan. They hit the first pass of the financial projections, you know, and the expenses are too high, income, revenues are too low. And so they go back and they redo it, they redo it, and redo it. And finally, in December, the managers say, well, what the heck is it number do you want me to hit? And so they say, okay, and they, each department comes up a way to hit their numbers. And now what do we have? We have a set of numbers not driven by a strategy. And that spills over into the nonprofit world too. And, and a lot of the nonprofit world uh, makes a lot of assumptions about what they cannot do. I don't know about you guys personally, but when I've worked with a not-for-profit world, there's an awful lot, well, we can't do that. Uh, you know, I worked with the housing authority of the city of Tulsa. And um, one of the board members called the director, I won't mention names here, an excuse bag. You have an excuse, we're not funded. We can't be funded, we don't have enough funding. We can't raise that kind of money, da 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 They get into these circles of, you know, spiral downs and that kind of stuff. And I've literally done it and I've seen it done elsewhere to where we can bring a level of excitement. And some of these nonprofits, it might take two decades to get to a certain point, but think about it guys in the context of, of you know, a corporation like Apple, Hugh's favorite. He was a cult member at Apple incidentally. And uh, they, uh, but they're, you know, it took them years to get where they are. And did they have a roadmap that they were going to end up with the iPhone, the iPad, and all the services that they provide now? No. 
They evolved to that. So any leader of any organization is the leader of change. It's not my job to come up with a five-year plan that we're going to stick to, live through, and plow through, and just, you know, go over the top with our energy levels and our dedication to that. No. It's the doctrine that may drive you. The purposes, the value systems are critically important. Values can be a competency, incidentally, as a side note. But what's important is the people that are bought into that, including your constituents. And I think where a lot of organizations make a mistake, running, raising money, attracting people to volunteers and whatnot to work with them, they don't get them excited about it. Most of those organizations are about as exciting. They've been doing the same thing for 24 years. Uh, I work with one organization that's probably in its 30th year of the same annual fundraiser. And it raises about the same annual amount of money. And they just switch faces once in a while because donors pass away or donors get fatigued. So it's, it's where's the excitement? I, you know, they've got to get connected to your purpose, your why. A lot of books have been written about that. And, you know, we've got to go out and be very creative about how we craft and raise those fund those funds and the funding. So there's, there's two um, to the, your points. There's two videos that are very helpful. Begin with why the Simon Sinek video. It's right. on TED talk. Great. And, one. Then, and then the way we think of charity is, is dead wrong by uh, Dan Pallada. He talks about, we have this perception and we can't do it. We can't spend money for salaries. We can't spend money on marketing. Um, so he, and, and then we, there's this fictitious percentage of overhead. Is your overhead too high? Well, you're, if you got to spend money marketing, you got to spend money on body so you can serve the constituency and you can actually give traction to the vision that you, that you've articulated. Um, I, I think busting those, those old perceptions and, and, you know, that's, that's what I'm all about is helping people shift their paradigm. And as a matter of fact, I want to talk about the military part of tactics and transformational leadership because there's a synergy that just occurred to me that we've never talked about. So we'll expose it out here in public. But, but when you talk about strategy, I've actually had nonprofit leaders say, no, no, I don't want to write down anything. It will limit my creativity. And to which I come back and say, well, this is a solution map. And you've seen the Center Vision Solution mm -hmm. Map, and you said it's right. a strategy, Hugh. And it is. It's it's where you want to be, how you're going to get there is the, the simple definition. But my answer, and I want you to come back at this and respond to this, my answer is that if the, the, the strategy, the system is the container for creativity. You now can be creative because you know how to be creative. You know where right. you're going. And you get the energy. So part of this is looking at your phases as you grow. And so you're already keeping, always keeping fresh. And you're doing the, talk about the, the, uh, that limits creativity. Also talk about how do you keep it fresh, your, your process of migrating it over time. Talk, talk about those two things, if you will. Well, the, the limitations on creativity is because we, corporations especially, Everybody looks to the management for the answers, right? Creativity comes from the top, and that is totally 100% false, okay? That's not generally where it's going to come from. The creativity in the future of any corporation or any organization comes from within the people themselves and an examination on a periodic basis of that external environment and how it's changing, both for opportunity and threat, okay? Corbin, I, did he talk about SWOT analysis? He did not. Uh, well, one of his, he and I both abhor them, not yeah. because it's not a bad tool. It is, it is the way we implement it. Because everybody has the tendency to want to talk about what? Their strengths and their opportunities. They sweep the rest of the stuff, the, the weaknesses and the threats under the carpet. <laughs> and so as Corbin likes to say, you are left, if you have two of them, you have a so-so strategy because you're only focused on, you know, opportunities and strengths. And so you don't, you build an organization in response to people and constituents and how they're changing over time. You know, one of the things that I, that limits a lot of creativity. I, I, one of my great frustrations when I run planning sessions, I've got young people in the room and I know they're creative as hell. And they got great ideas and great thoughts, but they don't want to embarrass themselves. They don't want to bring that out. The leadership doesn't necessarily bring that out. In fact, in my early career, when I facilitated some of those meetings, 
it was, became a dialogue between myself and the CEO of the company. Boy, was that meaningful. Not. Mm. So we were limiting the creativity. So we shift around and, and we invite that creativity in. In fact, I encourage my CEOs of both nonprofits and for-profit organizations, do not start laying out your scenarios. Let's come up with the scenarios. Let's keep the antennae up. Invite that. To me, one of the great signs of success as an organization where I get compulsive innovation, okay, and collaboration. People talk around the water cooler, so to speak, although there's not many water coolers anymore. Uh, talk around the water cooler about what's going on and what's the future is and what the organization is. And we usually do periodic methodologies where we, or techniques where we check in with people and find out what's changing about our constituents, what's going on. For example, if you want to get millennials involved in your organization today, they won't touch you with a 10 foot pole unless they can identify with your why, your mission, your purpose, and how they have a role in fulfilling that. So it's a whole different ball game. So the, the limiting behaviors become because we have a tendency as leaders to bring people down the paths that we believe are important. Now that becomes a little trickier in the church world because they have doctrine, right? We have to deal with doctrine. I also find doctrine personally as an excuse not to address what our members need. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It's a, that's, it's a barrier. That's a little bloody of a statement, but I think that's a fact based upon my experience. So what was the second half you wanted me to talk about? Well, actually, that, to that point, that's one of the things that's limiting the church. The Methodist Church is losing 1,200 members a week, and, and that's not unique among mainline denominations. So right. We've not, we've not made it relevant, and we, we don't have a strategy, and the Methodist Church globally, nationally, internationally, says that their mission is to make disciples, which that's the commission. So they need a strategist to help them develop the mission, what you do after you make disciples. So we could talk about that all the time. It's, it's, it's having somebody that understands how strategy drives results and helps you create it. It's not inside. It's somebody yeah. external. It's, the other part of it was your, your multi-phase growth plan and, yeah. and migrating it over time. Yeah, well, basically what we do is typically bring an organization or a corporation or whomever we're dealing with, we'll break them into a three- or four-phase growth plan. Okay, and that will cover a five to seven year horizon. We don't have much detail, nor are we doing resourcing on the phases out to phase three or four. We're resourcing that next phase because then we're using our quarterly meetings and our interchanges about what's changing and where's the opportunity, the rear view mirror and the windshield to determine how we're gonna change it. And we continually update that phase growth plan, okay? And even in the financial arena, we do a rolling horizon set of financials. And so every quarter we update that plan, literally, and it, it takes less than a half a day to do it. But what a great investment. So you're always revising that plan. And once you start down that path or that mode and you've got people engaged in doing that, it changes the whole dynamics of the corporation and its growth. And I've seen it, I mean, I've done it. I've done it in nonprofits. You know, my favorite one, Hugh, the Life Senior Services here in Tulsa, where I reside, it's just such a dynamic organization. And my latest one down in Houston, Texas, called Reasoning Minds, they're a nonprofit about, you know, all about, uh, uh, you know, math education is what it's really about. And, in, in, and so the bottom line of they're they're sitting right now on $25 million a year of revenues, income streams, because of how they've structured. We got them out of the scarcity mode. We got them into a phased growth plan. They know where they want to be five years from now. And they had to kind of bite the bullet and do some things differently this last year. Came out of our strategy. They're getting rid of some things that were just kind of skeletons that hung in the closet forever, like committees and stuff. They were wasting an awful lot of time because nothing was attached to a framework. It was just motion and commotion. Don't we all love committees? When I went <laughs> When I was in the corporate world, you know, they had committee meetings. You know how I treat committees? I said, okay, you can form a committee as long as you write the epitaph for that committee. Tell us what your definition. What day is it going to die and what's going to be the epitaph that says what was accomplished? So what is your yeah. definition of a committee? It's a place where good ideas die. <laughs> yeah. No, it, they, they have a tendency just to become, you know, we've got the audit committee, we've got this committee, we've got the HR committee, we've got the comp committee, we've got this, that, and the other. 
but they're not attached to a strategy. They become functional because they're supposed to do things. And, it, and it, you change the dynamic. I'm not saying you kill committees. You just change the dynamics of what they're attached to. What's their contribution in the overall strategic plan, the objectives? How do they contribute to that? You get the committee to identify that, and then you migrate it over time. I don't know about this killing thing. I've, I've, I've spoken to a few people on the intake about uh, team execution, and they got really excited because they thought they were going to get to shoot people. Yeah. <laughs> they thought execution was a firing squad, huh? That's it. I shouldn't joke like that. So um, uh, this is a lot of really good tactical stuff. So let's look at um, the the grand strategy is a model of you have an objective and then you define the tactics for that objective. Transformational leadership was birthed out of the, the military model where you, yeah. can't, you have to have a high performing team that you cannot micromanage when you're in combat. Now, mm -hmm. You know, I have reframed that to be an orchestra model. Um, and in concert, you can't be telling people what to do. You've got to have all you have of your together. You've got to have rehearsed. But it's it's the integration of you know here's what's written the dots on paper into performance. We've got to make it come come alive. And so right. so the grand strategy comes out of this this world. Speak a little bit about objectives, and we we see a lot of people um, doing this, that, and the other. People ask me if. Um, now we're talking to social entrepreneurs that might be running a charity or a church or a right. business. And, and actually nonprofit executives are entrepreneurs because we're doing the, okay. we're not doing the corporate thing. So people ask me, do all of you entrepreneurs suffer from insanity? And I say, heck no, we enjoy it. Yeah. <laughs> well said. <laughs> so, so this whole military model of, of, you know, put it laying down this track to speak a little bit about the genesis of strategy and how that, that well, relates. And yeah, have they, work, in the, work in the leadership piece, if you will, the, the integration. Okay. Well, the, the, the whole thing to just kind of expand on what you were saying there, strategy has all of its birth. It's, it's, you know, when I became a student of strategy, there was a gentleman who wrote a book called either on grand strategy or grand strategist, I think it was. Guy's name's Michael Davidson, which was published in the 80s, early 80s. And he was the mentor that Arthur Young hired to supervise us seven young renegades on how to put this process together to sell it to our clients. And anyway, it was all, he made us read Napoleon's Maxims of War, Tun Tzu on the Art of War. There's a book called The Critical Analysis of Vietnam War, which its basic premise was nobody understood what the mission was. Therefore, how could you ever win, mm -hmm. which was pretty well borne out in the Vietnam War, sadly. Uh, you know, so it's in, in some of the Middle East wars or even have that kind of flavor to them. And the troops don't understand the mission. It's hard for them to react in the field to what they're supposed to be doing. So, you know, and a lot of if you go deep, deep into the military axioms, one of the words they never use is goals. So anytime you hear me use the word objectives, they're interchangeable. Goals have a tendency to be a little softer, a little fluffier, not a sharp edge. Military people like, I'm going to take Mount Sarabachi by next Tuesday. And we want that kind of sharpness in our objectives, in our organization, so that as the department's divisions, the people that are working on it can break it down into pieces. The other thing that you learn about military stuff when you dive a little deeper is mass scale and superiority of defense, okay? Now, charities don't usually have to work in terms of superiority of defense, but if you think about it, our nonprofits out there are competing for dollars and volunteers and people. So there's a, there's a whole thing about, you know, building a defensible position. And so the, the, you know, the military world and its leadership, as Hugh was talking about earlier, you get the troops out there, they're bought into the mission. They know we're going to go win this war. The mission is to complete this war. And so they understand the mission, and their attachment to that becomes, you know, how they behave in the marketplace as they execute your strategies, as they, you deploy resources. And it all ties back to that mission and that set of objectives. So we like real clarity of objectives. And if the objectives are not, we, we let our business units and our subdivisions of our organizations, they come back and say, no, 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 your long-term objectives are wrong. We need to change those. You know, and uh, oftentimes they're not shooting high enough. So 
a lot of the military stuff involves leadership, but it involves leadership to the point where the people are doing what I talked about earlier, which was that, you know, almost compulsive innovation and collaboration to make things occur. They'll work across departmental lines. It's not selfish. And that's a lot of the problem with corporations. There's too many people competing with each other to rise to the top. Uh, so inside of those charity organizations, I really, really think it, it's more critical maybe that we have that clarity of vision, mission, and the attachment to purpose. Okay. And, and I, I, you know, the leadership has got to help embellish that, get people to buy into it, not just tell them what it is, but buy into it. Why should they buy into it? And how does that impact their daily work life when they're working with the organization? So I don't know if I've successfully done the consultant bit and avoided answering your question or if there, <laughs> if I was going where you thought I was going to go with that. Well, Russell, why don't you weigh in on that? Well, yeah, I, I think you answered quite a bit there why, why it's important for nonprofit leaders to, to buy into these type of things. And I think that thinking is a lot softer in these nonprofit circles, but with today's climate, we got to be a little bit firmer in our thinking because you're in business, you're providing value, and people need to see that. They need to see that value. We're in a place where there's a lot of noise out there, so the people have a lot of things to choose from. So if you don't give them good, firm calls to action, they'll go look for somebody else to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. And you, you almost have to, uh, with some of the problems we're facing, you have to be tenacious to get the resources and to make a real difference in people's lives out here. The climate has really changed. Uh, Okay. Uh, in terms of what's out here, what's available. The government is looking to do less and less. And uh, so they don't necessarily do everything sometimes well. Sometimes it appears that way, sometimes it doesn't. I don't know. <laughs> well, they're, they're looking to do less. Figure from... out what our government is currently, what direction they're heading in, please send me a memo. I need to understand. <laughs> I'm confused. Well, I, was, I was just thinking about that remark that you made about the consultant not answering the question thing. You, you're yeah. going to have to get a lot better in the double talk to, to run for office. <laughs> no, oh no, you don't know. I would never succeed as a politician. <laughs> I've been told I'm excessively blunt in declaring the truth. So <laughs> I guess you can't do that as a politician. But I, but I also think the importance of our charities too, one comment that just pinged into my mind, you know, we've got a lot of poverty, people that are downtrodden, let's face it, we still got bigotry in this country. We've got a lot of issues that are social issues. And I've found when the people get engaged and involved, that's when they get solved. Government does not have a great track record of solving social issues, okay? And, and nor did our forefathers ever frame it to do that. So we need our charities to step up and succeed. The good part about it is, is there's an awful lot of money and wealth out there that want to get involved in charities. Businesses today, for-profit corporations, will not survive another decade without a purpose-driven agenda. Mm -hmm. They don't stand for something greater good than their bottom line for their stockholders. They're not gonna exist. The millennials don't buy into that. Mm -hmm. My youngest son got invited to General Motors up in Michigan, to, uh, and I was just had happy feet because we just dropped $140,000 on his education. I thought, God, he's going to get this great job. And he comes back and he said, I can't work there. I don't like the way they do what I'm asked to do. I don't like the, you know, anything about their values or their systems. It's all about the profits. He said, in fact, their processes are bad. And he said, I will fail if I go try and do that. Because I did the standard dad bit. I said, well, just get it on your resume for a little while. So I think coming back full circle to that, the, the, the public-private partnership is only going to get bigger. You see more and more organizations working with nonprofits and really dedicating some resources. We've got a lot of billionaires out there that are looking for some. I got involved with a deal that it collapsed, and I can't mention all the names, but you took the five wealthiest families in the country. Three of the five were involved in this project. They want to get their money back out in circulation for meaningful things. And so, you know, there's an opportunity to do that. 
but they don't want to just hand their money to another charity that's going to just kind of fizzle and maybe have a low end impact. They want the exciting stuff. And, you know, if you're a purpose driven business and you've got that aspect, I'm not talking about building the foundation and handing out money. I'm talking about getting truly involved and, and adopting and working with these charities to really make things happen. And that's where the leadership comes from. One of the reasons, just a quick side note to Hugh and the leadership world, my, um, when we so succeeded this Life Senior Services Group and built such a powerful, responsive, well thought of organization that people fly in literally from all over the country to see, how the hell did you guys do that, is their question. <laughs> and, you know, we have 35, 36 board members. People would think, well, that's a little unwieldy. I wouldn't want a board. Well, everybody's looking at it from the aspect of the boards, you know, supervising and overseeing and that kind of stuff. No, no, no. That board's there to work with smaller groups and truly get involved in the execution of the strategy. And we've attracted some great business leaders out of the community. And oh, by the way, there's a few of them that provide money too and help us raise additional money. Although we've gone to a I like a self-sustaining revenue model if I can get to it. So, you know, the whole leadership thing is, is critically important, but you've got to do it in the context of about something that people really get excited about. There's well, an old ad. Go ahead. That brings us to the, the third uh, question to ponder. I posted some on the website. The third one to ponder is, is about the board being engaged in the planning process. But to your point, Ed, the, the integration of, of planning and performance or strategy and performance uh, you see people that write a strategy and becomes credenza aware, so it never gets integrated into the culture. Right. And right. we see people that are doing leadership and teams and all this stuff in the absence of a strategy. And so that's why I've created this non-consulting position of the, the transformational leadership strategist. We, we, you, you can't separate leadership and strategy in my world. It's, no. it's got a, it's got a, it's got no, a little, totally. you know. I agree. So the, the third point to ponder was about, the the board's engagement and you've we've spoken about it in this conversation we're on the 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 down end of this hour we've got 10 minutes 11 minutes left so i want to hit some of the highlights of integrating the board into the process in in my experience in 31 days 31 days 31 years i've been doing this a while 31 years <clears throat> that the planners and the doers are the same otherwise they're never going to be engaged so talk about that a little bit and then um, we're going to talk about how do you predict the future as we wrap this up. So talk about how do we engage the board in that process? Well, the way we do that, okay, because we use the focus framework process, which we developed at the Hallowood Halls of Arthur Young years ago, tweaked it a lot since then and adapted it to the nonprofit world. But what we typically do is, you know, the board level types of discussion, um, we set up with the boards that works really, really well, Hugh, and I, I think you do some of this also. We set up mentor, one of the reasons we have 34 board members on Life Senior Services, we have mentoring and masterminds going on. I call it the M, the M and M's and the A's. Okay, and we build master, we build mentors. We use our board to mentor some of these people, help them build plans. We help them sit with the departmental people and discuss their plans and help facilitate it. It makes a huge difference. The masterminds, we're masterminding what that future is. Everybody has inputs and portals to all of the things that are going on externally to our organization that might impact us in the future. So we have masterminds of growing on and people plug in, plug out of those. So, and the leadership has a, ten, you know, wants to kind of monitor what's going on there. And you know me, Hugh, I'm an alliance partnership freak. I think one of the ways you get things done. One of the reasons that Life Senior Service is successful, the Housing Authority is successful to this day, is because we built alliances with the people we needed to do to execute our strategies. So the leadership has got to, you know, in the planning process, to me, there's, there's two pieces to it. One, there's that overall, what's the purpose of this organization? What are some of our longer term visions and objectives? Okay. And some real clear definition there as to how they see that. So that we get at least a little bit of a quadrant of, you know, or a scope of what we're trying to accomplish. And then the other part of that is, is when the lower pieces of the organization flow that information back up, they react to that direction 
again, some of them have been involved in mentoring and masterminding processes, and now they've created these departmental and divisional plans. And so they, you know, now we've got a total integration between the board and the, the, the lower levels. And that's not possible in every organization, but it worked well for most. Did no. I successfully avoid your no, question? No, no, that was good. There's, there's not one right answer here. There's, there's no, a, and it, it does take on the personality of the organization. Yeah, yeah. One, yeah. one quick comment, just because I don't want to miss it in our last few minutes here. People that volunteer, get involved in boards and that kind of stuff, flat need to be excited yeah. about what it is you're doing. And too many of these organizations don't look to their future and how it's really exciting. You know, when we have seniors, back in the days when we were just forming up, trying to get what was Tulsa Senior Services is now Life Senior Services, formulated and moving forward, that organization, it just wasn't exciting. It was just mamby pamby. Oh, they need a hotline. They need a, you know, to find services. They need information. They need, you know, uh, access to housing, caregiver services and all. It was more the perfunctory things that these people made. And we transformed that organization through the leadership about, man, when we started talking about the impact, the why of this business and the why of that organization. And people started buying into that. And then we transformed that down into the action. And we did it pieces at a time, you know. And when we got that level of excitement up, then we attracted the funding. That's the key. We want to go and say, please give us money when we haven't really done the prep work on the front end. They don't know what your brand is. No. I don't know if you got into talking about brand, but people don't buy into a brand today unless they connect to it emotionally. Okay. Well, well, one of the things that came up with um, both David uh, Dunworth and David Corbin was that everybody in the organization represents the brand. Mm -hmm. And so part of the engagement of the board is to understand what the brand promise, the brand identity, all of those brand pieces, understand what it really is mm -hmm. and how do they fairly represent the organization. And, um, you know, it's um, not, done that way in most of the charities that I've, I've seen. I don't know about you, but uh, there's a real connection with who are you and what do you represent? Yeah. And, and look at the dragon off an airplane and then, you know, you get, have, have uh, Ann Coulter moved out of a seat. Ann Coulter missed a great opportunity that Delta was able to make it about her rather than right. their, poor, their poor customer service. Uh, <laughs> but we didn't, we won't mention the airline. Sorry. <clears throat> um, you can take a pick, but uh, those are brand slaughter. It just it just really um, does a damage to it organizationally. So as we as we all of this works together, and we it seems like it's an endless process with a lot of work. It is some heavy lifting. Yeah, it, is. it is some intense thinking. Um, it's probably not as hard as most people make it. No, when you do it as an evolution, it's like raising your children. You're not going to get them, you know, or open up things to them overnight and have them, you know, understand all their possibilities. It's, a, it's an evolution. And that's why we go to a phased growth plan and then continually update that. But it keeps that vision fresh. Back to the brand thing just one more time. It's brand, the brand emotion. All brands emote. It took me years to convince software developers that their brands had emotion but I finally won those battles <laughs> in most of those organizations. And even in your charities and your, you know, nonprofit organizations, what's your brand? What's, what's exciting about your brand? Why would I want to get it attached? Because one of the things about the millennials today, who incidentally by 2020 will be 40%, 40% uh, of the workforce. By 2025, they'll be north of 55 or 60. So we're going to be dealing with the people that are millennials. They have to understand the purpose, the emotion of your brand to get connected to it. And yeah. I think that's maybe, maybe, I'm not saying categorically it's all of it, but that may be part of your problem with your churches. They're not no. connecting emotionally yeah. their brand to those younger it people. It is. It is. And, and millennials will not substitute anything for integrity and authenticity. Authenticity. So right. if you're not authentic. It's it's the boomers have done some disingenuous things and the, the millennials don't really want to have anything to do with it. And 
actually my article in the, my magazine, the Nonprofit Professional Performance 360, which you can find at nonprofitperformance.org, by the way, um, is about the similarities between the boomers and the millennials. So we're going to wrap up here and I'm going to, I'm going to have a message about our, one of our sponsors, the one that's promoting this, that we're promoting tonight is supporting the podcast. But then Russ, um, like you to do a little wrap on what you've heard. And Russ has been making some really good notes, Ed. So we have the Ed Bogle sound bites in the chat, which we will post on the page. And they're the too small chat. for me to read. I'll have to go back and read them. <laughs> or you'll see them on the page. We'll, we'll okay. incorporate them. And then uh, um, Kate Lumberg is going to transcribe it. And so it'll be in the podcast um, notes. Um, our, so I'll ask for Russ to do some, some closing comments. Then Ed, we'll leave you the last ones. Uh, an impression a tip, a thought that you'd like to leave people with as, as we uh, close out this, this webinar tonight, this nonprofit exchange, where we interview business people about installing business principles and systems into the charities that we lead, because in fact, it is a business. It's a tax exempt business. Today's podcast is sponsored by Rock Paper Simple. Joshua Adams and his team, a really skilled yeah. team, at Rock Paper Simple, don't just build you a pretty website. They, they help you let the world know about your brilliance. So it's your brand personified online. And it's not like other websites. It actually generates traffic. It actually engages people. And it actually converts people to your tribe. So rockpapersimple.com is where you can go and ask for a free consultation. Because just because you have a website doesn't mean the world's going to know about it rockpapersimple.com, Joshua Adams and his team, tell, you, tell him that Hugh sent you and ask good questions and he'll give you really good answers. Russell Dennis, what do you got to say on the back end of this interview? Well, this has been all very good uh, information. This is really good stuff and it, it's very important to have a strategy. Everything starts with strategy. You're dead in the water and you, you get nowhere if you don't know what you're doing. And it's really critical to have younger people engaged. And, and some of these issues I've seen as a veteran going to veteran events with veteran organizations. And there are no veterans under 25 at any of these events. And so in my mind, that's a problem. Uh, but we see this across the spectrum. So your work has to mean something and your work does mean something. It means something to people out there. It's getting connected with the people that your work means something to. That's the challenge. And that takes a little bit of work, but there's a lot of work that has to be done internally and you have to constantly have an improvement system. You have to constantly measure and monitor what you're doing and you have to be excited about it because if you're not excited about it, who's going to write you a check? They're not going to be excited about your work if you're not excited about it uh, either. So uh, it's really important. I like uh, when it comes to masterminds and mentoring, I like the idea of reverse mentoring, getting some of these millennials in to teach yeah, right. older guys like us about these processes and new things. <laughs> hmm. So there's an opportunity inside an organization to do reverse mentoring because we got to bridge that generation gap if you're going to be relevant down the road. Yeah. Once again, Russell uh, one ups me. He's brilliant. He has these little sound bites that are just precious. Ed, take us out. What's some closing thoughts for people? Thank you, Russ. Uh, closing thoughts. Strategy is a discipline as part of your management process. It starts with your constituents and how you're trying to serve them and how you're going to migrate it over time and clearly understanding your brand, your brand emotion for them. That's where it all starts and stops. Because there was a brilliant guy, Theodore Leveth, was one of the founders of the real marketing strategy world, said a business or even an organization for that matter is all about finding and keeping a customer. And you better take that orientation, start with your constituents and understand them and your brand and what it represents to them. Really great words. Ed, thank you for sharing lots of really useful stuff with us tonight. Okay. I'd be happy to, you know, anybody that wants any further information on this, I can be happy to share templates and that kind of stuff if they'd like to look at it further. 
Okay. Right. We'll have a comment section. Uh, they go to nonprofitchat.org and uh, the video will be posted there. And there's a link to go to the Nonprofit Exchange podcast. You can listen to it in your car. So thanks, Ed, for being with us. Thank you. Enjoyed it.